Lately, there's been a lot of talk about HD systems with Sharkbite and DJI being competitors and Orca teasing a new system. With that in mind, I started going back and looking at some of the old systems. And one of those that stuck out to me quite sharply was FPV Blue. FPV Blue seemed to be quite a promising system at the time developed for wings uh, using 1.3 and eventually 2.4 gigahertz. But it never ended up making it to the mass market, and the project ended up being canceled by its creator. Today, I'm going to talk to that creator, and we'll learn a little more about FPV Blue, how he feels about the current HD market, and if you can ever expect to see FPV Blue technology in something else. You said a few months ago when you reached out to me that you were going to do this interview, it's like concept with different people, but I couldn't find anybody in your channel, right? Yeah, so far it hasn't, I don't, uh, I have this problem where I feel like I want to do uh, as much research as possible and I never feel like I have enough information or research done. Um, and so I always feel like I'll waste the opportunity from talking to someone, you know, by, uh, by like, you know, not having enough information, not being well informed or everybody will be like, ah, oh, you didn't know what you were talking about or you should ask this or that or the other. So I always want to make sure that I have the best information when I go into something. But um, I've recently okay. learned that maybe that's not the best plan. And the best plan is probably just to do uh, the best I can and then actually talk to someone and just figure it out. In so, Joe Rogan style. Yeah. Okay. So I saw that, uh, you know, so I saw that this product existed, you know, there's a lot of um, conversation about HD video going on these days um, mm -hmm. with the with the DJI system, of course, but with um, Fat Shark is developing a Sharkbite system as well that came from uh, Divamath and their HD Zero system. Yep. Um, so I'm curious to know, um, you know, you started this project back in 2015, it looks like, was when you had uh, production boards for the FPV Blue system mm -hmm. is the system that you uh, created. So um, can you tell me a little bit about, like, you know, how did you get into it? Like, where did you start? Were you in the RC hobby or did you do video or did you have pr program experience? Yeah. So, yeah, this started as a... Uh... When I first got into the RC hobby, I started building, say, long range uh, wing aircrafts, right? So those, those were fixed wing aircrafts. And the problem, of course, was that the video transmission quality was absolutely, absolutely horrible, right? Because we only, only, we only had analog and I guess you can also call it, say, first version analog devices, which are much worse than what we have today, right? Uh, there was no advanced diversity receiver or anything. And you will pay, say, through the nose, maybe even $80 for a transmitter, maybe $160, $140 for a receiver to have a terrible experience where, you know, maybe your device might break up 200 meters away, 200 meters away. And when it doesn't break up, it's all static. So I had, say, some programming background. I wasn't a very good programmer, but I guess I developed, say, some fairly large projects with my, say, miserable skills at the time. And I figured there is absolutely no way this this cannot be any better than this. So I say started say experimenting with a few uh, solutions that were going through LTE. I don't I don't think LTE existed at the time. I guess it was even a three G network connection. So I bought a couple of Panda boards, uh, which were I guess TI OMAP um, development boards. So within a week of, say, experimenting with those Panda board devices, I actually managed to get a working result and I uploaded that to YouTube, probably back in 2014 or something. So you can find that video if you like. And it's just, you know, me asking my mother to go around and drive during a Sunday with this Panda board on their dashboard in their car. And me, say, connecting to that remotely from my, from my home. And the thing was working fairly well. Latency was around maybe 150, 200 milliseconds. Uh, it was based off off-the-shelf devices components. Uh, it was fairly inexpensive, and it was just basically just one single line of code. You know, I was using GS Streamer at the time. It was very simple. Um, so what happened after that is I moved abroad, uh, started a electronics course, like engineering degree, and I wasn't say learning very much during this course. So I figured I'm gonna. I might use my free time and some of say the the income I have from this other business that was like the only successful business I had at the time to to build this this dream of mine. Um, 
I figure it was never going to be extremely successful or even say um, reach economic break even. But that was never the objective. The objective was mostly just to learn about microprocessors and say embedded devices and this huge impossible and fathomable topic, which is HDFPV. So I guess at that time, the first one of the first things I did was uh, say looking into PCB design manufacturing, which I had no idea what it was at the time. And then I started hiring my first say external freelancer which was this Pakistani person, which you know, was working for Intel, Intel at, at the time and was very well versed, well, sorry, well versed as far as everything electronics manufacturing is concerned. And I pretty much learned from this person over the years then. And I guess if you're look, thinking of 2014, 2015, I guess you're thinking of, say, maybe the photo I have as a background in the Facebook page. So that was like the very first prototype. Yeah, there was an early blog post on your fpv.blue site um, yeah, in that August too. 2015. That's the one that I was looking at, was just that, uh, that early. You know, so that was a very post. different time for FPV. How long have you been in this hobby? Um, so I've only been in the hobby for about 15 months now. So I'm kind of, that's part okay. of this uh, project is going yeah, back to learning. Things were completely different at the time. Uh, there, there was no, say, drone racing. Drone racing was this like new fancy niche hobby. And um, most of everybody was just flying wings. And wings were, were the cool thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then everything changed. Yeah. I guess maybe when, uh, at the same time that there was this Dubai drone racing rally. Um, very famous. With a $1 million prize. I forgot. It was an insane number. Yeah. Um... So as you saw the system develop and you saw the evolution in the market, were you still yeah. just like doing this as a hobby? Was this like still all just like, I still don't think this is, I guess what I'm saying is, was there originally an idea of commercial viability? And then you were like, oh, this isn't going to work out. Or it was always just like hobby. I don't think this. The has objective any, like, always was just to break even. That okay. was like my most say, uh, optimist expectation. Gotcha. I think it would be crazy to, to say any, and to, to say otherwise. Um, yeah, I never had any, say when, when I was thinking of, you know, the next batch for this product, the only thing I would think about is can I actually make enough units to bring price low enough that I can break even the objective never was, can I make enough unit to, you know, repay all of the expenses I had that was like a pipe dream. Right. Uh, because I spent something like four years working on this, mostly part time. You know, I was studying at the time, so I was like a full time college student. Uh, but I guess the course wasn't really in pain, uh, sorry, taking up a lot of my time. So I had a lot of a lot, a lot of free time. I was studying for the exam, say, the day after, sorry, the day before. Um, and then I spent maybe a year uh, working on this full time after I uh, to finish my degree. Maybe okay, so you months, did. Nine months. You did do some full time on it then. So when you um, when you look at a project like this, do you think this is like uh, like what was your barrier to making it uh, cost effective? Like, would you have had to produce your own chips, or would you have had to get in bed with like a large company, or do you know what that would have taken, or was that just something you did, wouldn't have considered at all? Are you asking like me with all of the hindsight I have or me what I was thinking at the time? Uh, I guess both, you know, like at the time, like, were you considering like looking at bigger partners or were you considering, you know, I, I think um, as this timeline went on, obviously eventually DJA released the system, but you know, <clears throat> there were also the other, um, you know, a couple other HD systems that came in and out during that time. Um, like and I just wonder, Pro yeah, like Connex was, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it was a very small market. Nobody was caring about it. Say all of the discussion I had with, say, bigger partners, say, I know, the big names at the time that maybe are not such big names nowadays, but they were like Immersion RC, Team, Back, sorry, Team Black Ship, uh, Fat Shark, all of those people, they were all like, yeah, we can see a need for this device, but nobody really cares. Analog is fine. And it's going to cost so much money to make this, say, analog, sorry, digital FPV ASIC that it's not really worth it. Uh, we're never going to, say, get back into our annual and expenses, which for an ASIC are really well, sorry, very well in the, say, $5 million range. So nobody ever, 
they will say a lot of say, um, what's the opposite of optimism? That thing in the market, especially <laughs> as far as, yeah. yes, thank you, pessimism. Yeah. There is, there was plenty of that, even, even despair, you know, I mean, people, people want HDFPV, but they don't want to pay for it. Like, yeah. um, the first batch of my product was put on sale for like 95 euros. And then I decreased the price by one year, every hour for like a week until, wow. until the entire batch sold out. And I remember the actual selling price was 275 euros for a transmitter, a receiver, uh, including the camera, including HDMI input, uh, including pretty much everything you want, everything you need. Wow. Um, latency was okay, I guess. I mean, yeah. We, we, we could talk about that later. Um, I mean, it's a very interesting topic, right? Because uh, if you had the money, if you had the will, if you had, you know, a few engineers you can close in a closet for like 18 months, you can make a nice product, which is what DJI did. Yeah. But say the joke going around the community at the time when DJI first released the, their HD FPV system was that uh, they're never going to make their money back. Not only their money back, they're never going to make the money back that it cost them to make the molding for the DJI goggles. So I guess there was a lot of, you know, pessimism. Yeah, I, I think I guess that... now that we have say, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't know that people thought that, it, you know, uh, you know, Joshua Bardwell put out a video months before DJI came out that said HD FPV is impossible to do in I saw that video and I was like, I don't want to say bad things right now. Okay? I don't want to say, yeah. this, say it's a lot of words, but I was like, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. And he prefaces all of his video by saying, you're going to learn something today. And I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> let's talk about so, it. But I think that's where, like, yeah. it seems to Sorry. me like that's where the market was at at that time. It was like, hey, we, we this isn't really feasibly no. possible for, like you said, you know, we can't do it for the amount of money. And you wouldn't expect somebody to put engineers in a room for 18 months to make this happen. And, uh, you know, but from I what mean, I can there tell... There are two, two ways to look at this, right? The first one is... Um, can, is sorry, it, it, I'm sorry. There are two ways to look at this. The first one is... Is it actually possible to do it? The second problem is, is it say economically feasible to do it? Right. right. And what Joshua, brought, um, Joshua did was saying, it's technically impossible to achieve all of those constraints. And I like very much disagree with him at the time. The answer was an ASIC. Um, I don't know if I knew about the DJI ASIC at the time, because I know they've been saying in say beta release, ver um, pre-release, um, private beta, for many months before the actual announcement, I believe in even maybe a full year. Yeah. And and everybody was freaking out because they they actually managed to, you know, get great results using their own ASIC. Yeah. And it's, it's awesome. It, we had um, you know, so in parallel with that, you know, Fat Shark has released Sharkbite now. Sharkbite is the yes. predecessor or the um sorry, the um the the new version of Bite Frost, and Bite Frost was essentially HD zero from Divamath, um, and from what That's I can, right. yeah, from what I can tell, that works on the Divamath chipset system. So Divamath has their own chipset and their own ASIC that they buy from a AT, um, and so they um, buy they, from AT. They, yeah, they buy an AT ASIC, um, and so the theory is that with Sharkbite, they've made their own ASIC, but nobody can confirm because there's just no labeling on the ASIC. Uh, yeah, this is a very interesting chipset. Um, it's so very expensive. Is, you yeah, know, so it's that's, so expensive. It's pretty much the cost of the transmitter. Right? So it makes you wonder how can he possibly be using this guy? Right? Yes. Yeah, that's kind of what um, the big issue is. That's what people talk about a lot is, um, you know, um, have they made a new ASIC? Like, did they somehow find the funding to make a custom ASIC through Divamath and Sharkbite? Because Sharkbite was, uh, or sorry, Fat Shark was purchased. That, that's, that's what I know. I mean, you're, this guy is just, you know, the RF transceiver, yeah. which is like a completely different component than the guy, say, taking the video in and compressing it. So what okay. my understanding is that, yes, Divamath and Fat Shark actually pulled in together some Chinese investors and made their own ASIC. They rolled out yeah. their own ASIC. And yeah, so if that's... It's if not that's good, the... but... Well, so that's the I question. I guess at least it. it's an ASIC. 
Yeah, so that's the question is, is, um, you know, because they've put this development work into designing this ASIC that they have, and you, we can see the results mm -hmm. out of the system currently. You know, like we can see the videos that they put out from the cameras that they have. You know, there's a lot of people saying that like, oh, maybe they can just make a camera with a better sensor or something and that will like vastly improve the system. I mean, OK, um, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating right now, OK, because I have no actual yeah. insight on how the system works. Yeah. But I did download the, say, raw footage that Joshua Bradwell put up a few months ago, right? from yeah. one of their latest releases, right? And they claim the system is 720p. Yeah. That's now what 720p looks like to me. I don't think that's 720p. And I hope that I don't get sued for saying this, but I don't think it is. Um, I think it's somewhere close to like 480, maybe 560p, and it's, it's upscale. Yeah. That's now what 720p should look like. You can look at FPD Blue for what 720p looks like. Right. There shouldn't, it should be very difficult to tell the difference between 1080 and 720. Yeah. That's, that's just barely more than analog. So my understanding is that um, DVMAT developed most of the system. And then they went yeah. to Fatshark and they pretty much pitched this chip. Um, so Fatshark was working with other partners at the time and those partners decided not to put their names behind the... Um, what 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 would then become the shark bite system because they weren't satisfied with the results um as far as i understand it it's a say i guess you could call it a clone of the pro side say the connex system okay so there is no video compression everything everything happens in real time or next to real time and what they oh. did was actually try to find a way to say compress the huge bandwidth of a uncompressed uh, video stream down to whatever is manageable, like 20 megahertz or whatnot. I mean, if, if you ever done the math, um, so take 720p, right? That's uh, 1280 times 720, which is approximately a million pixel, right? And then you probably want at least a 60 FPS refresh rate. That's uh, 55 million, say, pieces of information per second. If every pixel, sorry, piece of information takes you one byte, that's 55 gigabytes per second, yeah. which is kind of a lot, right? So what these DVMAT guys are doing, those DVMAT guys are doing is just find a way to compress this information a bit, then send with some very simple modulation. Um, there is no video encoder, there's no video decoder. It's just some math, DVMAT. So is it is this why uh, is that part of the is it part of the reason you skip the encoder is so you don't have to do the latency of the encoder I guess or is it because you don't want to have the work like you don't want to develop the chip to do I guess the work? it's both right because you can you can say license encoders and decoders that can have maybe one millisecond latency okay so that's not really the problem the problem is maybe those encoders are gonna bring up your ASIC development cost by five hundred grand or something like that I don't know. I see. So, so here's another question. You mentioned that an ASIC might take like $5 million to develop. Something I hear a lot yes. in the industry from people who I assume don't really know too much is they say it would cost like half a million dollars to develop the ASIC. Is that because of ASIC quality or the choices you're making on the ASIC? Things like that? Okay. Are you like familiar with how ASIC development works? Like, do you have I sort of. Like I filled, I filled out a sheet to get one design. Okay. You know what I mean? So, but like, I don't know that much about it. <laughs> you filled out a sheet to get one of those annual expenses for like the MSFC? Is that yeah. what you did? <laughs> yeah. Did you hear back? Uh, just from the g general quote thing, you know, that's, that tells you a general number <laughs> and it's from some random company, you know, but um, yeah, okay, I'd like okay. to know from the backside. Um, so back when I was interested in Bitcoin and this was like 2012. Uh, so there were, there were those first companies that were working on their first ASICs, right? And those were mostly um, 130 nanometers ASICs. So yeah. very, very old gen, but that's like the gen that even nowadays is very, is very well established and very inexpensive. Okay, so broadly speaking, if you don't take non-recording expenses, sorry, development non-recording expenses into account, you just think of the mask and say the, the, your first initial batch, you're looking at maybe $150,000 for 130 nanometers process. And from some of say the back of the envelope math I've been doing for you know my own purposes here, I don't think uh, that 130 meter proce 30 nanometer process can work for an FEV ASIC. 
you have to go probably to 90 or 45 nanometers. You're looking, so a 45 nanometer ASIC uh, is something in the region of, of alpha million dollars, just for the mask and some initial very small prototype run. You have to add to that all of the actual development, right? All of the engineers that you have to lock away for 18 months in a room. Right. So it's tricky. Yeah, so the pr production cost might not be, you know, 5 million, but everything together becoming the production cost because of all the development costs and everything uh, to get it yeah, out the door. Of, I believe, like, it really depends what you're trying to do, okay? Uh, 5 million yeah. is uh, is not my, um, my guess. It's not, yeah. a, say, something that I came up with. Uh, one of those, say, big name CEOs told me this figure. And oh. I, I rapidly, I thought that it was very high. Uh, my estimation has always been in the say one, 1.5 million range. Okay. So... Something like that. I forgot, but that sounds okay. very reasonable to me. Because I don't think there is that much engineering work involved. I mean, what DJI did was like amazing. Okay. You can't touch that. It's like state of the art and it's going to stay, 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 sorry, stay so for the next maybe even 10 years. Uh, but I think you can get very close with maybe one third of the effort. Okay. You know, just to, to give you some perspective, like um, DJI is, I, I don't know, I'm like 95% sure DJI is using H.264, right? Very standard video encoder and decoder we all, we all use, which, you know, this conversation is being recorded in H.264 right now. But um, Google developed an alternative coder a few, a few years back. And was called VP9, I think, which yeah. is currently being used as an alternative to H265 on YouTube. And as part of their development process, they also um, they also developed a hardware bitstream, so a hardware, say, I-level hardware language that you can then use to synthesize your own ASIC. And this is available for free. Which is like, and that should blow your mind, right? I mean, yeah. can you actually get one of the most important pieces of the puzzle for free? You can. Yeah. You just have, you know, Google VP9 hardware implementation. You have to fill in a form with Google, and then you're never going to be hearing back, unless you are, <laughs> I guess, one of those big companies, right? Because I tried several times. I even heard back from them and explained my user case, and the conversation ended there. So that just say, imagine you can do that, right? Imagine you can get the bit, sorry, the encoder and decoder for free. Imagine that you can then somehow hack this encoder or decoder to, to be very low latency. Because I'm sure Google wasn't really caring about latency when they were developing this thing. But if it works yeah. anywhere close to H.264, you should be able to do it. I mean, it's probably complex, but you should be able to do it. You have the biggest, one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle done. The other piece of the puzzle is, of course, encoding, uh, say, the... So you the first piece of the puzzle is getting you from 50 gigabytes per second to maybe 50 megabytes per second, right? So right. a 1,000x reduction in, uh, in bandwidth uh, requirements. The second piece of the puzzle is uh, actually encoding this into some kind of RF domain mm -hmm. and transmitting it, which is... I mean, can be difficult, but isn't that impossible? There are many ways to solve it. Like one of them is Wi-Fi. Um, I'm going out on a, on a tangent here, okay? But I think Wi-Fi six is is promising, uh, especially for say short range. I think there is some possibilities there. I haven't actually explored them. I wanted to do it, then just decided to give up on everything. But uh, you have, say, longer guard intervals and all of sort of, say, different RF features that might actually be helping you. Anyway, if you were to develop an ASIC, the next step of the, uh, of the puzzle, of course, is encoding the data. Encoding the data is very simple. I mean, it is relatively simple. Decoding the data is where the trouble is. Um, that's, like, the biggest problem. I mean, if you were, like, truly crazy, you could probably go outside today, sorry, go, go out today, go home and try developing some kind of um, GNU radio based transceiver radio. Um, and maybe there is a way to port that to an ASIC. It's very unlikely. Uh, 
it's probably a lot of work but that's like the I, I believe the biggest problem the biggest puzzle um i'm not sure about this but i remember reading on the rc groups forums from one of those say um users with like ten thousand messages and a 15 years old account that dji was using something weird like they weren't using like OFDM, like orthogonal frequency division modulation they were using something very special even like uh, maybe leading edge and hmm. they were i mean it was some kind of trick they were using that it was only pub that i could find it was only published in some kind of research papers and there was no actual implementation in real life so i think what dji did was state of the art absolutely i mean i have no idea what this person is saying so but i have no reason not to believe them yeah yeah it seems like um you know everybody is looking at systems and hoping that somebody comes and and competes with dji i just i agree with i think your general sentiment that like dji is 10 years ahead of everyone and they are you know like they from what i can tell you know from mm -hmm. my research and looking at things the dji air unit is an ocusync 3.0 beta device and eventually uh, no. essentially because if you look at so. if you look at the new DJI drone, it uses OcuSync 3.0, and it's essentially the same idea. Um, if you look at the air unit, it's actually missing the 2.4 gigahertz chips on it. And when they filed the original FCC filing, the paperwork said it had 2.4, but they didn't use it, um, which is how the OcuSync systems work. And now in the new DJI FPV drone, it has OcuSync 3.0, which is essentially using a similar transmission system with the same set of goggles, you know, just a new pair with 2.4, um, and they're doing. Um, I don't really agree so. with any of this. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's why. Um, you know. Okay, so I'm trying to remember, okay, because it's been a while, but um, okay, I'm okay. I'm here. Okay, I got. Okay, so uh, before the OcuSync, there was the light bridge, right? Right. Yeah. which was a 2015 era um, device made of the analog devices chip we just talked about the ad 93 whatever hundred dollars per, per per piece in a thousand batch order um transceiver and an fpga and there is a github somewhere and I'm, I'm not sure if i can find it anymore that follows the progression of the different hardware revisions of the light bridge and you can see that they go from using an off-the-shelf FPGA for, say, the main processing unit to, a, say, completely unheard of kind of Chinese FPGA. And then they move on to their own ASIC. To a, I'm, I'm sorry, not their own ASIC, but uh, to an, say, two years old Chinese company that developed what you could probably say is their own ASIC. Interestingly enough, um, this um, this brand, this new Chinese brand, goes on both the FPGA, so the processing unit, and the analog devices transceiver. So somehow they managed to replicate those both. Sorry, both bo both of them. Um, I mean, I know that chip makes out a lot of money, and I know people have tried to duplicate it, but it's interesting that they managed to. Um, and I guess it makes sense if you're selling something in the order of maybe one or two million drones per year, right? Figures. Right. Uh, because all of your, say, numbers add up and it doesn't make sense to, you know, give any money to analog devices or whatnot. Or Altera or Xilinx or Intel. Um, but that's, uh, that's the light bridge. The OcuSync was based on a completely different chipset from a cell phone manufacturing company. Uh, I forgot the name, but it was one of those say native Chinese companies that you know sprung up over the last five or 10 years and started working on smartphone chipsets. Yeah. So the question is so, why, why would no, they okay, release? I mean, it's, it's, very, it's, it's very interesting. So I, I, I wanna tell you a couple of stories here, okay? Okay, sure. yeah, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, if the OcuSync first version or second version of the OcuSync was based on these off-the-shelf components, then 
why didn't I use it? Sorry, why didn't I use it? Why didn't everybody else just run to the market as soon as they say open up the first uh, OcuSync Air unit and see this chip and set inside and go use it? And the answer is that this chipset was using uh, some internal DSP, digital signal processing units, for for the, of course the uh, sorry um, for the transmission. Okay, so. I mean, I'm not sure if you'd like me to go into detail about this. I should. I? Yeah. Yes, hundred okay. percent. Okay. Um, as long as you're okay with doing so that, I'm if happy. You, if to you take, it. yeah, yeah. I mean, I it's, it's been years. I don't think any of this is under NDAs or anything. Um, so, if you are trying to develop a modern uh, a modern uh, smartphone chipset, what elements do you need? You need a lot of processing power. You need an LTE modem you need hardware, video, encoder, and decoder, which are almost all of the components you need to make a DJI OcuSync Air unit, for example, right? So the, say, the missing piece of the puzzle, the reason why 95% of the um, chipsets out there that are using for smartphone, that are used for smartphone, like the ones you can buy from Qualcomm or whatnot, um, are not suitable for the job is that usually the um, LTE modem is an ASIC. It's like written in stone, you can't change anything. So you can't operate that at like 2.4 gigahertz or 5.8 or any frequency which isn't standard. Okay. Um, what they managed to get with the OcuSync is uh, you had the hardware encoder and decoder that was say a bit slower, say the latency wasn't subframe, so it was a full frame worth of latency like 60 milliseconds or whatnot. Um, little side note, uh, if your encoder is processing one frame at a time, your end-to-end -end latency is way bigger than 60 milliseconds because you need to wait for a full frame to be received into the camera. Then you have to process the frame and that's two frames already. Then you have a send buffer, which is probably another frame. And then at the receiver, you have to receive a full frame before you can start decoding it. So when, say, thinking of a high level uh, of those high level problems for HDFPV, you absolutely need some kind of um, way to split those frames into micro, micro blocks or say, whatever. Because the, the latest, sorry, the buffer the receiver is going to kill you. Anyway, what DJI did with Yokosync was they managed to find this company. If I have any idea how those things work, the company went to DJI and pitched them the chipset. And they were like, sure, we can use this. Um, problem is, uh, this very infamous DSP engine inside the chip is proprietary. So it's not documented anywhere publicly, as far as I know. And I know that this company went to say other people and asked for one full million dollars for the NRE expenses of developing mm. something similar to the OcuSync. So that was like the big um, killer at the time, if you like. Because yes, DJI is using this chip and DJI probably got the non encoding expenses to zero for zero, but any other company that was trying to use the same chip would have had to shill out an insane amount of money like a stupid and insane amount of money for a chip that was very inexpensive. I believe it was something like $20. Um, yeah, very interesting story. So that's the OcuSync. And what DJI did for the DJI FPV HD system is completely different. There is no OcuSync. There is no third party company making chips that just so happen to be compatible with the purpose. It's just an ASIC. So the question I is... I mean, it must be some kind of military ASIC because it's so good. The, there there my, is a my, version somewhere out there. My question is, why did, they, why did they release the new DJI FPV drone with OcuSync 3.0 instead of with some like Lightbridge 2 or like, a, you know, like something like that? I mean... Like because I'm not it sure uses... even a question. Like Lightbridge has always had very high latency and... 
Well, whatever, whatever, whatever Our voice never suitable for the purpose. Whatever technology is in the DJI Air unit for the FPV system, presumably, yes. is similar to what's that's in the drone. Right? But they're calling the drone yes. OcuSync 3.0. So that's my confusion. I think that's just marketing. I mean, I haven't, I, I never okay. bought a DJI HD drone like was released two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I never took one apart. I didn't see pictures of sure. the PCB. But yeah. I think the specs are so similar that it's the same ASIC or maybe a different revision of the same ASIC. But my guess would be it's the same piece of silicon. I mean, it's the same thing. Like 95% the same thing. They're calling it 3.0, but it's just a small upgrade. I mean, it's possible the original, the original silicon was capable of, say, 144 hertz uh, from the get-go. But they limited that in software. Maybe they didn't have a camera that was fast enough. And now they plugged in a camera that was fast enough and they got whatever. Yeah. Three percent better quality. Um, something I, I never learned about is that the original Oculus, sorry, DJI system was limited to four kilometers, I think, right? Yes. Like, uh, four it miles. wasn't a question of antennas. Yeah. yeah. Okay, four miles. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't a quick question of antenna, it's just a tip, sorry, time of flight and the thing was designed to pretty much shut off as soon as you went far enough. Yeah. And they're marketing a new drone for 10 kilometers, so that limitation must have been removed somehow. Yeah, when they did the... My um, guess, it's a software upgrade, right? But who knows? Yeah, when they did the um, 1.06 update for the V1 goggles and the air unit, um, they included 50 megabit per second mode instead of 25 megabit per second um, by doubling the bandwidth that they were using um, and uh, changing to three channels instead of the uh, seven channels plus public that they had before. Um, and when they did that change, when you switch to 50, that doubles the range. Interesting. That's very yeah. interesting. That must be some physics thing, right? Because, I mean, That's if you think about it, yeah. if you double if you double the band, okay, so I'm, I'm guessing that the reason I'm using only three channels instead of seven or eight is that they have more bandwidth, more F, sorry, RF bandwidth, right? Yeah. Yeah, they take up um, a... I think it's like 20 more megahertz so, or 15 more megahertz or something like that. I okay, so the... say the original version is 20 megahertz and yeah. 50 megabits per second you're using 40 megahertz at the time. Yeah. That means that you have to run your FFT, uh, your fast Fourier returns from, for twice as long. And I'm guessing that maybe that also means that your symbol transmission time is twice as long, which is why there's a like, glitch in the system is gone. Interesting. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, it was definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not saying some kind of completely wrong. <laughs> yes, but I guess we'll find out. It's okay. <laughs> um. So uh, a couple other just general questions I had about the system. So when you, with your work that you did on the system, how much of it mm -hmm. was like proprietary? versus how much of it was just like buying off the shelf components like was it you know you talked about pcb design and stuff like that um yeah. you know is it so uh, I, yeah like how much ip is job, here? like that sort of thing yeah a lot of the job was uh well i didn't know anything about electronics when i started this so that's why the reason it took me so long uh, that was like half the job like two years worth of work uh everything else was um, so there were two versions of the system that were developed, right? The first one was a 1.3 GHz version, which was very, say, dumb, as in there was no uh, video retransmission opportunity for the frame if some, some bytes were lost in, in, in transit, right? So you had to make sure all of, all of the data was arriving all of the time. There was no retransmission. Um, and that was, say, not very proprietary. I mean, most of the work there went into the uh, Da Vinci Media Encoder that had some, say, barely documented options for low latency encoder and decoder. So getting low latency to work there was like the bulk of the problem uh, of the work. And as far as the 2.4 gigahertz version was concerned, everything was very different. Like, there was a lot to say research and trying to, I mean, I did some crazy things for the 2.4 gigahertz version. Like I was trying to fit the, the uplink channel into the guard interval of the transmitting uh, DVB-T system, which is like, 
it's kind of insane. The idea is uh, if your transmitter is sending a signal that uh, say your transmitting symbol changes maybe every in some modes maybe even up to two milliseconds okay that means your guard your guard interval can be as long as 500 microseconds which is like an eternity right so maybe what if you can fit an uplink inside a guard interval mm -hmm. what if you can convince the say decoder loop that this um this period of nothing being received at all is not something they should be working on in their in their loop and just just ignore it. That that was I like see. the insight for the two for Giza version. That was very nice, I think. But yeah, that was like pure hacking, like a hundred percent. Was I'm I'm still proud of that. That's awesome. That's that's really cool, man. Yeah. That's the kind that of stuff good. that's like super neat. Um, do you think that so? There's a lot of people I've shown the system to because it's super, you know, it really impressed me when I was looking at the video because I don't think a lot of people have heard about the FPV Blue system. Um, have you, uh, you know, when you went back and looked uh, like at the other options and stuff, like, I don't know, man, yours is really nice. It's just, I believe the only issue, obviously, at this point is latency because it was meant for wings. Um, do you think mm -hmm. that there's, do you think there's a situation in which like your technology could be used by another company? Somebody would want the IP that you have um, that would be useful to anybody at this point? Um, that sort of thing uh, is certainly a question a lot of people have asked me. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish, man. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a difficult question to answer, of course. Um, because I've spoken to a few companies about this problem, right? Uh, most of them, sorry, many of them were interested. Uh, I, even, I even flew out to say to the States a couple of times, um, but nothing ever came of it. Yeah. My last say, re rejection email was like, hey, uh, what you, so that was about, so this was about the 2.4 gigahertz version, right? And they were maybe looking into working on the 5.8 gigahertz version for their own specific application. My last rejection you made was like, hey, we're extremely impressed with what you did. Congratulations. If you need help in the future, do reach out to us. But this thing is just too complicated. It's not in our domain area of expertise. We're not going to invest into this. We're going to focus on what makes us money. Bye. Okay. Gotcha. So yeah, that's, that's like, I completely understand why you're still in business and I'm not. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so it's just interesting because, right, you know, we have OpenHD. Um, there's that system that's out there mm -hmm. and people are still trying to work on. Um, but, you know, Orca has teased that they're developing uh, like an OpenHD system as well. And that once they develop it, it will be open and developable. And that's what they've told people. What? That was their what? statement. Orca is working on ASIC, right? I don't know. They haven't said anything really publicly. I think uh, so, yeah. Okay. I mean, they, they, they did publish that on their they, but they, okay um yeah i just saw like a yeah, statement from them about it um that they were doing the they were going to get into hd um i mean yeah to be honest i'm excited about them i mean i hope they can say give give dji some some smoke yeah i think some that's smoke. what everybody wants yeah. you know um, that would be great yeah it isn't it isn't work alone they're working with another company i think um, I'm very yeah, optimistic. I mean, they have some um, military contracts too in the U.S. Um, so I, yeah, I saw that recently. I was like, okay, you guys, yeah, uh, rock. I'm, I'm yeah. always amazed by seeing that. Yeah, yeah. So like, hopefully, yeah, that, I can see where your money is coming from. Right. Hopefully, that helps push the other development, and, and we see that bleed into the yeah. general consumer market too. You know. Um, yeah, Orca is the one I'm excited about. I hope it works out. We're going to see. Yeah, Orca seems very promising. Anyway, they, you're uh, saying they put out a, a blog post saying that they are actually thinking of this as some kind of open platform for other people to do. It will be. On. Yeah, they promise it'll be open. Even though it's an ASIC. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, it worth, um, my, worth my heart. It's going to be nice. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a little bit in the weeds, but we've had an issue recently, you know, DJI, you see, um, how it works when they produce a new product, you know, because, um, I don't think you'd see the same thing. You don't see the same thing with fat truck produces a product, um, as far as customer support, 
um, DJI is just so large that like they don't support anything that they do really on a fundamental level. So when basically there was this, it's really frustrating, but I'm sorry, so large that they don't support anything that they did on a fundamental level. I yeah. So like customer support is inexistent. Like basically, yeah, they're paying hourly support agents, you know, yeah. to read out of a book that hasn't been updated yet for the system that they've released, you know, and it's really sure. frustrating because they're giving information to people that's wrong. So they'll tell people that, mm -hmm. oh, your goggles won't work with the old system because their book doesn't say it will work with the old system. So then they're posting on Facebook the thing they got from support that says it won't work. And now half the community thinks it won't work. And um, it's just unfortunate that that's how they've decided to do things. But basically, they released a V2 goggle um, and they released a drone goggle. They were two different SKUs. They're both labeled V2. This is the problem. So one of them came preloaded. No yeah, one of them came preloaded with drone firmware on it. And unless you have a drone, you could not activate those goggles to use the old system. But they shipped those to customers who bought standalone V2 goggles. So customers started getting V2 goggles that they could not use because they couldn't activate them because they were in drone mode and they needed a drone to activate to be able to switch out of drone mode. It's such a like cluster, you know? Um, and basically the fix was wait four days for DJI to give us a private login to an account that lets you roll back to an older firmware that adds an option to those goggles to move over to the other system. Like that was their fix. You know, um, it's just something I don't Can think I we would have seen. Yeah. I think it's interesting from an engineering standpoint, thinking of how those goggles are probably internally designed, right? And you telling me that there are two different, um, say, firmas that you can upload. One of them is for drone racing and the other is for, say, the standard goggles. Yeah. Makes me think that somewhere in that boot process, the main processor in the goggle is sending uh, this bitstream to the ASIC. And the bitstream for the ASIC was designed specifically for the FPV racing drone. So that's your answer. That thing is definitely programmable. There is a processor inside the ASIC, like 100%. Hmm. Which means all of those upgrades are software. Maybe it's a new ASIC version, of course. Maybe it's a new hardware revision, but those upgrades sure. are software. Like the 50 megahertz and the, sorry, 50 megabits per second and the lower range, longer range. Yeah. It sucks. I guess DJI yeah. sucks, but they're also awesome in some form. That's the problem. Sorry it's for the... giving them. Yeah, it's the, the best thing. The problem is that they're so big, right? I mean, DJI yeah. FPV is just a rounding error in their book shit, in their books. Yes. They sell, yeah. what, a million drones per year? They used to be selling that maybe a few years ago. They got, I don't know, like half a billion dollars from the Chinese government. They don't care. Yeah. They're like, if you can destroy some of these ecosystem, let's do it. Yeah, I think that can... You know, I got an origin story for the DJI FPV system, which I have no idea whatever it is true or not. Um, I want to share it. Yeah. And if the guy that told me this story wants to, you know, uh, probably this interview is not going to be listened to anybody, from anybody, but... If the guys wants to kill me, just come ahead and go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> uh, they told me that uh, there was this race in Beijing, right? This uh, drone racing event in Beijing. And then you had high government, sorry, high ranking government officials uh, looking at those racing drones and look, seeing all of those, say, TBS black ship or maybe immersion RC or whatever, whatnot, uh, devices on them. And DJI was also present. And some high-ranking brass just went over to DJI and told them, why the hell isn't your product in this in this device? Drone racing is so cool. Why aren't you in this business? We're giving you so much money. Why aren't you in this business? You should take over everything. 18 months later, this happened. Right. I have no idea if the story is true. I like it, though. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually heard that a little bit before too. Um, it's just so, interesting yeah. because it's interesting because DJI, um, you know, recently a lot of people have been looking at their older things. You know, DJI has produced standalone ESCs um, and motors before for racing, and they're called the Snail and the Tachyon. Um, I mean, they have been producing their own ESCs and motors for a very long time, right? It's it's yeah. in all of their drones. 
Yeah, Rotor Riot actually did a video back in 2016 with like an FPV racing drone that DJI sent them with their parts on it. I mean, it flew like garbage, you know, they said it flew really bad at the time, but um, it seems like they've always been trying to poke in and just see, because I think as you said, it's like an error correction on their books. So at some point it makes sense to just try to see if there's um, if there's like anywhere to I grab mean, into I on guess the if you look at this from the DJI standpoint, they were just making a lot of motors and propellers and ESCs and they had this huge, uh, I guess, supply chain in place. They were like, can we add 5% to the supply chain and bring them 4% more margin? And, right. and they tried. I think it's as simple as that. I think it wasn't, there are some theories like when the first, um, say news about this new DJI system went out, there were a few people in the business that were like, oh, DJI has been trying for so long to pierce into their, our market, they're never going to be able to do it because their old ESC from five years ago sucked. And I'm like, bro, like seriously, you, you have an engineering team that is basically one guy. What are you talking about? Right. So yeah. It, another scale. So, um, another scale, yeah. So do you know that, you know, Fat Truck was purchased by Red Cat Holdings. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. So that might be, you know, they've talked about That's it. That's interesting, in, isn't it? Yeah. They've talked about it in, in forum posts and things that, um, you know, hopefully they'll be able to use their money from that to push more into the system. Um, Why do you think this, this holding company should give them money? I mean, I have no idea what I'm talking about here, but just from a yeah. business standpoint, you're, you're purchasing an asset. These assets should be generating money, jobs, just be a huge black hole you think money into, right? Yeah. Why um, should I give them money? I don't know. I mean, they, they already have their own HD FPV system, right? Yeah. And it's not very good, but they're, they're committed to it, I guess. And yeah. For the next, I don't know, five years or something, it's going to be that. Yeah, they put out Maybe a I'm statement. Wrong. Maybe. They put, out a, they put out a statement 10 days ago um, that said they are committing to... They basically asked everyone to email, post on Facebook, all over their social media, everywhere, to give them every bit of feedback they could possibly give them. And they're committing to a two-week communication cycle. So every two weeks, they will be putting out a statement um, to everyone with exactly what they've taken from feedback, what decisions they're going to be putting into the product, where the product is at currently. And basically, they're saying that, like, hey, we're going to try to be transparent with this. Um, they also took uh, this guy, Greg, who's been the main head face of Fat Truck for a long time, um, off of PR totally. Um, he's no longer um, interacting with anyone publicly, as far as anyone knows. It's now um, like a, a, a group Fat Truck statement, and it's also Alan Evans, who's the other guy at Fat Truck. Um, so it seems like they've done like a shift lately um, with the Red Cat uh, changes and with the Shark Bite release um, to kind of push into a different, I guess, customer facing thing. And hopefully they'll, I don't know, I think everyone wants them to compete. So hopefully now with this change, we'll see some kind of push forward um, from Shark Bite and like, I don't know, maybe I don't. The You're saying the, that they want to have a two weeks release cycle for say feedback and improvements. Yeah, two week communication uh, cycle. What does that even mean? I mean, I, I guess they appreciate it. It's very nice of the company to do so, but does well, they that mean a... that if the feedback is going to be, can you please try to spend five million on LASIK that they're going to do it? I don't think so, right? Well, I think maybe I would hope that, uh, you know, and um, that part of that statement would be, hey, you know, we've heard that we want it, you want it to be better and that we're committing to making it better or whatever, or we're not, and this is the system you'll get or something like that. You know, hopefully we can get an actual statement like yeah, that. I, but maybe... Uh, maybe I, I became very pessimistic with, to the world lately <laughs> over the last couple of years, but I don't think a company is going to make business decisions based on consumer feedback. I yeah. don't think that's how this works. Maybe that's fair. Yeah. We shall see. They have about three days to put out a statement, so <laughs> we'll find out what their first yeah, statement Yeah, okay, so are. I'm sorry. You're saying that like uh, all of the community gave, gave this feedback and the feedback was what? Well, it's, it's, it's to their email and everywhere. That's the thing is they're, they're just saying like everywhere you can contact us, send us all your shit. And like, and, and we're going to okay, get in a room, we're going to take all that have... feedback and we're going to sit in a big boardroom meeting and we're going to put all the feedback okay. in a table. And we're going to decide what makes the most sense. We're going to come back to you and tell you what our directives are, where we're going with things, and what we think about what you said. It was kind of the idea that I got from okay. them. Yeah, we'll see what, what they say, right? Yeah, yeah, that's where I'm at with it is. We'll see what they say. So we kind of talked about it a bit, but do you think there's any way for someone to, 
like basically this the only way forward in this industry right now for HD video that's going to compete with anybody is developing a custom ASIC and like having somebody 100% yeah 100%. Okay. So there's only so many players that can be a part of this. There's no like off the shelf crazy solution or there's no like like open HD isn't going to get together and like some, somehow beat this thing or, or come up with a solution okay. that's yeah. Okay, so uh, I just want to get those cuz that's something there's so much maybe, in this industry. maybe maybe 5 years down the line Qualcomm is going to release a new a new chipset for their smartphones that just so happen okay. to have all of sorry to tick all of the boxes. That's like your best bet. I see. But low latency, hardware, video encoder and decoder, why would they ever want that in smartphone? I guess maybe with like um, 5G internet communication devices, maybe there is some, some niche need for that. But I think it's very unlikely. Uh, it can happen, of course, but it's unlikely. And even then, say Qualcomm, you're not going to be able to buy any... Like if you buy less than 10 million chips per month, they're not going to be speaking to you. And yeah. those chips are not going to be cheap either. They're going to bring up your transmitter price a lot. Why a LASIK yeah. is maybe only like three bucks to make or something. Maybe less. Yeah. Gotcha. I mean, what DJI did with their system is incredible because they have the entire RF, sorry, radio frequency front end embedded into the chip. So it's just one single piece of silicon, video comes in, antenna goes up. It's fantastic. I mean, you, you can't go any better than that. Yeah. And you as you said, if it's, if it's software upgradable and they can just kind of do whatever they need to do, then it's even better because it's- I mean, the way, so the way an ASIC usually works is that there are some hardware blocks and all of the hardware blocks are controlled through some very slow microcontroller inside. Right. So the microcontroller is user upgradable. The okay. hardware blocks are set in stone, but it's usually fine because they're very well validated. So my, my guess is that the 50 megahertz upgrade is was just a soft. I mean, it was not like the the hardware blocks had an, op, an input option 25 or 50 megahertz. I think it's much more likely that the if the microcontroller inside the ASIC. Uh, say program the other blocks to to get that kind of output. That's I see. And yeah, OpenHD is just working with say off the shelf Wi-Fi chips, which I, I, yeah. I guess is great. I mean, I I know they work some of the time. Um, the problem with Wi-Fi, of course, is the the guard interval, right? Because as you go maybe 200 meters away, all of those refractions are going to destroy your incoming receiving signal. That's why DVB-T was working so well for FPV Blue. Uh, so is there anything uh, we haven't covered that you wanted to talk about or you wanted to discuss or anything? I can't think of anything. I feel like I, I, I spoke at length about those lovely topics. And it's been a but, while, you know, it's been many years. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know, I'm a big fan of these kind of conversations. Uh, whenever I see them, I yeah. click on them immediately. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really, yeah, I really appreciate you. Yeah, I really appreciate you talking to me. Um, and is there any, um, yeah, anything you need, anything you're doing publicly that you wanted to plug or anything or uh, any, uh, anything you want people to know or any, you know, just personal mantra or anything, man? No, it's just be happy with your own life and survive this pandemic somehow and let's hope that those governments gonna allow us to reopen soon because it's it's getting too much yeah i agree i think Thank everybody's you. on the same page with that so thanks a lot man i really appreciate it bye bye